I think we'll go ahead and get started. And yeah, uh, as people come in, they'll just uh, join us. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jeff. Um, I'm a co-chair for the NASW API Council um, in Southern California. Uh, and so today's webinar is the first of uh, two that address COVID-19 vaccine confidence among uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. Um, and so we're honored to host today uh, representatives from three organizations uh, serving those communities, um, EPIC, uh, PAC, and uh, Thai CDC, which uh, I'll introduce more in a bit. Um, and uh, just some background on this webinar and the project itself, um, the NASW approached our API councils in Northern and Southern California um, about a federal grant to sort of explore awareness um, and inform decision-making about vaccination within uh, AA and HPI communities. Um, and as part of that, we wanted to uh, honor the voices and experiences of Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Southeast Asian groups and their allies. Um, and so anyway, as part of this project, uh, we're publishing articles on the chapter website this summer, and we're also hosting these uh, webinars. Um, and also, I just want to thank our uh, planning uh, committee, which includes uh, Anna, uh, Ayaka, Kev, and Victor, and also um, Kimberly, Jane, uh, Alex, Tatiana, and Lucia from the NASW California chapter. Uh, so yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, for those of you wanting uh, one and a half continuing education credits today, there are two steps to take. Um, the first is this uh, sign-in sheet, which you can access through the QR code or link shown on screen. Um, and we can put that in the chat uh, now. Um, so I'll just pause here maybe just for a moment um, for you to pull that up. Awesome, thanks, Jay. And uh, while you're pulling that up, just know that the second step will be to complete um, a, a post-event evaluation, which will be provided at the end of the webinar. Um, yeah. Okay, all right, next slide, please. Okay, so just to briefly introduce our API Council, um, on screen is a photo of a group of our members from one of our recent gatherings uh, in Pasadena on Tongva land. Our council serves social workers in Southern California with remote and in-person events, um, including general meetings, uh, media club, um, uh, political community tours, um, and workshops and presentations like this one. Um, the council's mission is to advocate about the social issues facing uh, API communities in Southern California through uh, education, networking, um, advocacy, and capacity building. And uh, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us, um, and we can go ahead and put that in the chat. Awesome, thanks, Kevin. Okay. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so on screen are today's learning objectives, um, which are to uh, first um, learn community based efforts to raise awareness about COVID 19 vaccines and promote vaccine uptake in diverse AA and HPI communities so that social workers can adapt and apply those community outreach efforts in their roles. Um, second, uh, to gain at least three community, uh, sorry, uh, three communication strategies that have been found uh, effective to promote understanding and awareness of the COVID-19 vaccine series in diverse AA and HPI communities. Um, and finally, uh, to understand at least two structural and socio-cultural barriers for AA and HPI community members to accessing COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Uh, so that social workers can work to address those barriers with uh, their clients of A and HPI backgrounds. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, for today's event, like I mentioned, we have three presentations and those will be followed by a panel and a Q&A. Um, so I wanna just uh, briefly introduce each of our speakers and then before each of their presentations, I'll uh, share their uh, bio. Um, but so uh, first, you know, we're honored to have with us uh, Carla Thomas, who is uh, the Deputy Director of Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, otherwise known as EPIC. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next, we have uh, Aaron Ramirez, a Community Health Worker and Research Coordinator for Pacific Alliance Against COVID-19, uh, otherwise known as uh, PAC. And uh, we also have, uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Sheridan uh, Kai, Kai Ali, uh, research assistant for PAC. And uh, finally, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have Panita Jonsa, directing attorney at the Thai Community Development Center. Uh, so yeah, I think we can stop sharing our screen and um, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Carla a bit more if that's okay. Um, 
So uh, Carla is the oldest daughter to Samoan and Aymara parents who come from the villages of Batia in American Samoa and uh, Kime in Bolivia. Uh, Carla is the deputy director of EPIC and is based on the land of the Serrano and Tongva peoples in San Bernardino, California. Uh, Carla has a background in public health with experience addressing Pacific Islander health disparities and social drivers of health issues through coalition building, advocacy, research, and direct service. Um, and before joining EPIC, Carla was co-founder and policy director of the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Data Policy Lab at UCLA's um, Center for Health Policy and Research, um, and a co-founder of the first Pacific Islander Coalition of Community Organizations in the Inland Empire. Um, so Carla, uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, you know, first, just want to say thanks to the organization and, and the attendees uh, for the opportunity. Um, sincerely appreciate you all reaching out and um, allow me to share at least one side of, you know, what the Pacific Islander experience has been like during this COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so just to share a little bit, um, uh, just smaller details about myself and about um, the organization I'm, uh, I work at. Um, my background is in public health. Um, I was actually a grad student during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which was a crazy time to be in public health. Um, you know, immediately um, everything that I was learning, the training that I was receiving was um, in high need for my community. And so um, there was a lot of uh, movement for our communities to to organize because of the you know the dire needs of of of, of our folks uh, during this pandemic. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, also known as EPIC. Um, I serve as our deputy director, and EPIC is a pro-black, pro-indigenous, anti-racist national advocacy organization that promotes social justice uh, for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities in the U.S. diaspora through culture-centered um, advocacy, research, leadership development, and narrative change. Um, a lot of our work, of course, like many nonprofit organizations, had to shift during the COVID pandemic to address what were the most immediate and critical needs of our communities at the time. Um, so um, I'll also share just because of, uh, you know, um, I shared that uh, during the pandemic, I had also worn other hats um, and I was also working, um, uh, doing on the ground work with the local coalition um, here in the Inland Empire, which is uh, where I'm from. Um, I do wanna share a few slides too, but it's just just like a one at a, uh, like one or two, just to help picture things. Um, so bear with me. see if this will work. Okay, just kidding. My Safari browser is freezing. <laughs> um, okay, I'll just continue until this um, stops. But um, first, um, to describe who Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities are. Um, we are the indigenous peoples of Oceania. Um, Oceania um, also is comprised of three subgroups that were coined by um, uh, uh, European explorers. Um, and those include uh, Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia. Um, a lot of our groups are also uh, or our island countries have different complex relationships with the US, which impacts our access to um, different government resources and um, including um, healthcare, um, citizenship pathways, et cetera. Um, there are several um, statuses that uh, in, within the Pacific Islander community that only exist for our community, including those who live in the freely associated states under the Compact of Free Association, um, those who are U.S. nationals that come from American Samoa, and others um, in other U.S. territories um, like Guahan or Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands who uh, are granted birthright citizenship. 
I mean, all of this had played a role during COVID and how the, uh, the way our communities had access to uh, uh, necessary resources. Um, during the pandemic, there was a really uh, immediate concern for our communities because there were so many ex pre existing health conditions that um, impacted us. Um, some of the data that came out of the National Pacific Islander Health Survey showed that we had the highest rates of uh, chronic diseases and comorbidities. And because of that, um, a lot of community leaders were anticipating COVID-19 um, affecting us um, so hard. And a lot of that was shown throughout um, different news outlets when community leaders were saying, you know, we're seeing that our communities are dying um, disproportionately from COVID-19, but there isn't a lot of data to match um, what we're seeing on the ground and what, what is really our reality and, and our experience. Um, and so several uh, communities across the US, you know, banded together to address that data gap um, and had asked for researchers support. Um, for here in California, I know that our in our local Southern California region, um, we've partnered uh, or reached out to uh, Dr. Nines Ponce and folks like Dr. Brittany Mori at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research to ask to for support in uh, in disaggregating and censoring NHPI COVID-19 data to help communities advocate for necessary resources. Um, out of that uh, came the NHPI COVID-19 Data Policy Lab, um, now known as just the NHPI Data Policy Lab. And um, it started off as you know totally volunteer work where myself and other grad students were um, collecting uh, data from local and state public health departments um, who had COVID-19 data and bringing that together in a dashboard that centralized all of that so that our communities could easily use that in their advocacy efforts. Um, but it showed that, um, you know, disaggregated NHPI data wasn't, um, it, it was very hard to find. And for, uh, you know, COVID-19 data, uh, during the height of the pandemic, about only 27 states out of our 50 states disaggregated um, COVID-19 um, statistics for our communities. And, and even lesser um, within those states for California, just a little over a dozen out of our 58 counties disaggregated um, Pacific Islander COVID-19 data, even though we have the highest number of Pacific Islander populations on the continental US. And so all of that was a huge systemic barrier that prevented our communities from using data as a tool for advocacy to ask for resources. You know, so many times uh, for, um, you know, the language of policymakers, um, legislative officials want to see what the need looks like in numbers. You know, how many of your people are, um, are, are being impacted by this? And we just didn't have that. And so that's why it was so important for um, us to partner with um, folks at, um, at institutional levels to bridge uh, research and data uh, to the community. And ultimately that led to a lot of, of um, direct resources being allocated to uh, our communities here in California and also showed in different states as well. Um, some other areas where COVID was uh, hugely impacted uh, our communities was uh, places like, of course, Hawaii, um, and also Arkansas, where the Marshallese community has a really significant population uh, with some uh, numbers being even higher than countries in the Pacific uh, Islands. And so uh, with so many folks working in, you know, what we now call um, um, the, what is it called? Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the workforce, uh, I'm losing it right now. I'm forgetting the name that we always use, but um, uh, the folks who are just, you know, in need, they, these people could not not work. Um, I don't know why I'm not thinking about that, but that was like the main word we used throughout the pandemic. Um, if anyone knows that, please type it in the chat so I can <laughs> remember. But um, for our Marshallese communities um, in Arkansas, many of uh, who were working in uh, uh, meatpacking industries and other uh, uh, sectors where they were exposed 
to um, high breakouts of COVID-19 um, that had a huge impact. Um, essential workers, yes. I don't know why that, that um, I blanked on that, but thank you for that. Um, so many of our communities were essential workers and are, are uh, essential workers today. And so um, that was another um, huge barrier uh, for our communities um, in being more exposed to, um, uh, to the pandemic um, overall. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, data was such a huge tool for us to use um, to ensure that uh, vaccine resources, educational materials were brought to our communities. And also for us to ask that our community leaders were able to do that in the way that they know best. Um, because historically, uh, government agencies do not work with our communities. You know, they see us as being uh, too small in numbers to serve or hard to reach communities. Um, but when it came to the pandemic, um, you know, this was uh, a huge need for us. And so, uh, so uh, our, you know, community um, leaders and stakeholders would ask for um, ensuring that uh, COVID educational materials were translated into our languages. Um, for California, there are several non-Pacific Islander languages that meet the threshold um, where all government materials are translated into it. Um, but unfortunately, our numbers don't meet that threshold. And I don't think we'll, we'll meet those even in the next year or three years. Um, so we have to do something to ensure that there's equity in the way uh, we uh, provide resources and services to our communities. Um, so language barriers were huge because there's high um, uh, limited English uh, proficiencies um, for several of our uh, communities. Um, and so folks like Epic and um, were uh, training community health workers across the state to reach um, NHPI communities. We're working directly with translators to um, ensure that folks, despite not um, having English as their first language, knew where to go to access vaccines and to access uh, COVID testing clinics. Um, it was also so important for us here um, locally, where I'm from in San Bernardino, um, to work with our local public health departments um, to actually be the ones to run uh, COVID clinics or COVID testing sites, um, because our communities just didn't trust going to, um, you know, uh, to a doctor even to access um, healthcare. And so, um, especially with a lot of misinformation happening online, a lot of our communities were scared. They didn't know, uh, we know what the vaccine was or what it would do to them. And so it took, took a lot of uh, building trust with our communities to um, give them the assurance that, we needed this, um, you know, really, uh, it, it was a very high need for our communities. Um, and so um, a lot of our uh, coalition uh, members um, here in the Inland Empire, we established ourselves at the Pacifica Inland Empire Coalition for Empowerment. It's comprised of three Pacific Islander organizations. Um, one is um, MALO, or Motivating Action and Leadership Opportunity, which is Tongan led. Um, the Young Samoa, which is Samoan led, and Island Grad, which is led by a, a Chamorro um, advocate here in San Bernardino. And so um, our COVID clinics uh, would be ran totally by Pacific Islanders. You would see our faces there as volunteers, um, helping to also interpret directly between healthcare providers and um, elders and anyone else who needed those services. And we'd also provide them with, um, you know, even more resources, including uh, food bank um, necessities, um, just helping people to meet their basic needs because the pandemic obviously took um, a huge toll on everyone um, economically. Um, and so um, those are some of the key ways that I think that, uh, and that's just you know a, a microscope on what's been going on here, but that is just a you know it's a or a microcosm of what has been going on for all Pacific Islander communities throughout the U.S., where all of us were having to just take uh, matters into our own hands to address this because we have historically been um, underserved or not served at all by um, you know our our officials um, who should be addressing health, health inequities for us. Um, and 
I think that um, today, you know, even with the COVID-19 uh, declarations um, being over, our communities still feel the impact, whether that's through long COVID or, or uh, you know, being out of work because they're having to care for a loved one who um, was impacted by the pandemic. Um, so many of our people are, are still needing access to vaccines, still needing access to um, COVID education. Um, and that I don't think is going to go away um, just because, you know, the declarations ended. So I think it's important for us to just continue to be vigilant that this um, is still an issue for our community and that if we don't address, you know, that um, not only health inequities, but racial inequities, which are the root of those health issues, um, then we will continue to be, have the highest burden on any future, you know, pandemic that happens in the world. Um, and with that, I think I'll, I'll pass it to the next speaker, but of course, open to sharing um, or answering any questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Carla, um, for you know your insight from your work with like the data and and just really addressing the needs of, of these communities through resources and, and other means. So thank you, and, and of course we'll have more time to discuss your work in the, the panel later. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll be moving into the second presentation, which will be from uh, Pacific Alliance Against COVID nineteen, uh, otherwise known as PAC, and we're joined by uh, Aaron Ramirez and Sheridan Kaili. And uh, just to introduce them each a bit further. Um, so uh, Aaron is a community health worker and is the research coordinator for PAC an NIH uh, funded research study in partnership with the University of Hawaii, John A. Burns School of Medicine and the Aharo Health Centers. Um, he's based out of the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center where his work with the community includes the coordination and logistics behind uh, point of care testing in schools and the community and also uh, building relationships with schools and community partners to support increased access to COVID-19 testing, resources, and health education. Uh, he's also a community health lecturer at Kapi Olani uh, Community College and a student pursuing a BS in nursing with hopes to continue the work to improve health equity in underserved and uh, rural communities in Hawaii. Um, Sheridan is from Nanakuli, Hawaii, and is a research assistant for PAC based out of the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center and the Research Corporation of the University of Hawaii. Um, Sheridan has uh, contributed to PAC's COVID-19 testing efforts during the height of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, is currently working on the project's efforts to increase health literacy in Hawaii's youth. Uh, Sheridan recently graduated in 2022 with a BS in Behavior and Health uh, from Boston University, and she'll be starting medical school this fall to pursue her DO degree uh, to continue to address health disparities and improve health equity in underserved communities. Um, so uh, Aaron and Sheridan, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, and um, thank you for this opportunity to kind of share our work with you today. Um, Mahalo to um, Carla, who actually set up us nicely for what we're kind of going to discuss today. So, you know, a lot of what what she's experienced, um, and for most of us, especially in NHPI our communities, you know, the pandemic has been very tough on us um, in our communities, especially in underserved and rural populations. I um, mean, in our presentation today, um, we're going to discuss a little bit more about how we used um, some of the data in our initial um, project um, to better drive some of the strategies and the decisions that we're making at the community level to address health literacy and health ed ed education um, to kind of combat vaccine hesitancy and to um, kind of mitigate uh, strategies against um, the spread of uh, disease and not just um, COVID-19, especially when we talk about future pandemics and um, other health conditions that um, affect our communities. Um, so that's what me and Sharon will be kind of sharing today. Um, I hope everyone can see these slides. I'm not sure where my window went, but if that's showing, I'm just going to go ahead. <laughs> it's showing. Yep. Thank you. All right. So um, just to go over our project a little bit. So in our initial um, project and the paper that we're referencing mostly in our um, strategies that we're going to share today is that um, our project addresses the result in pandemic related disparities among Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders and Filipinos, especially in health and education. Um, you know, 
our NHPI communities have endured extremely high infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates um, when it came to COVID-19. Um, and NHPI and the Filipinos have also endured longstanding socioeconomic, educational, and health disparities, making them particularly more vulnerable to adverse impacts of the pandemic. Um, and second is to increase testing capacity and uptake in the rural and underserved communities where they live. Um, our project focused um, mostly on three, uh, three major islands. So first was on Oahu, um, where we and Sheridan are based. Um, and those were in the communities of Waianae, which is in the western part of the island, a very rural area, and is actually home to approximately 52% of the native Hawaiian population in Hawaii. Um, Waimanalo um, is also a very rural area on the east side of Oahu, um, which is predominantly native Hawaiian uh, population um, in Hawaii. We also serve Molokai, a very small rural island with a population of about less than a thousand people. Um, so access um, and just structurally their infrastructure to kind of support uh, for us to support them was very difficult. Um, and then on Hawaii Island, or the big island as most people know it as, um, we served a um, population was, that was very um, rural and widespread. So in Hawaii Island, we served Hamakua, Honoka, Kohala, La Pahoehoe, and Waimea on the north um, eastern side of um, Hawaii Island, um, which is a surface area of over 300 um, square miles. Um, with serving just a small population. So, you know, their support for resources was very far and in between when it came to um, COVID-19 um, mitigation. And it was very difficult for um, us to provide some of these resources to them. So um, how we did this was through engaged partnership and development um, with equitable decision-making through our partners, uh, mostly through the Wine Echoes Comprehensive um, where we work. Um, they are the largest FQHC in Hawaii and has a, a long-standing um, academic partnership with the University of Hawaii and their researchers there. Um, so with that, we were able to kind of get the needed support to move some of these projects forward um, and partnering with um, the Ahara network of um, pretty qualified health centers across the state. Um, in these major islands that we were servicing. Um, and that was at the Hamaku Kohala Health Center on the Big Island. Um, that was Molokai Community Health Center on Molokai, Waimanalo Health Center here on Oahu, and of course, Waianae Coast Comprehensive. And uh, through those relationships, one of the most important things is that we did reach out and got a lot of support from um, the Department of Education, um, the State Department of Health. Um, and with that, the continuing conversation about what the needs are for these communities was super important in driving um, some of the data that we had and what we could kind of procure as to resources that we could provide, whether it was resources to testing, um, any of the data that the state had, uh, any data that we were collecting, um, and kind of making decisions based on that. And one of the most important things too was that um, our health center here in Y and I, um, we have our own IRB, a longstanding IRB, and more recently a community advisor group that was, um, which is mostly made up of staff members here um, at the health center, um, community members, um, researchers, and you know that ongoing conversation of what was right for the community was very important in driving our work forward. Um, I think one of the most important things when we do our work is that because it is community-based participatory research, um, most of what we do was kind of drafted and um, kind of idea ideas coming from the community and kind of enacted by them also. So that's what made, it, made this really special and really um, kind of community-driven and really focused on the needs of who our community members were and what their needs were. So some of the uh, project objectives, um, well, what first aim was to build trust and strengthen community partnerships. Um, you know, and I, I think Carla kind of explained this too with the um, trust in um, government officials and other stakeholders um, and what kind of support that they were lending to us was pretty difficult. And especially when it comes to our population and rural and underserved populations, um, you know, trust was super important for us. So. With that, we really focus on finding the recruitment and enrollment of um, respondents or participants in our project. 
um, engaging teachers, staff, and parents as part of a larger school community. And we, we recognized that during the pandemic, you know, school was still functioning and it was a very, um, very accessible outlet into getting some of our resources out to the community was through school um, and through communication and education and any kind of outreach um, was very accessible through school uh, relationships. Um, and it was really important that we engage with other community organizations, uh, organizations doing the same work. Um, we knew that one, if we kind of just aggregated all of our resources, it would be a much easier time for us to kind of spread the wealth um, amongst what the community really needed. Um, and with all that, um, providing feedback to our investigators, our project investigators, to um, these community leaders and saying, hey, this is what we're finding, this is what community is saying, this is what community needs, um, and kind of acting upon that. Um, and of course, fostering ongoing dialogue, you know, as we go into like the closing, the, the end, end times of the pandemic, really, um, you know, it, it's really driven new um, strategies for us um, when it comes to, you know, where do we take this next? You know, that now that the pandemic's over and everyone's pretty much over it, um, what have we learned? And, you know, one of the things that Sheridan will share a little bit later is about how health education, health literacy has been kind of one of the major issues and one of the things that um, is lacking in our community. So, um, Second aim being um, building a sustainable public um, health infrastructure, um, expanding a well-established community academic partnership with the University of Hawaii. Um, and that was many of their departments. It was the um, Social Sciences Research In Institute, the College of Education, um, the School of Medicine, um, and then working with the FQHCs to kind of move the project forward. Um, it was also building a successful COVID-19 testing response um, program at the health center. And using our health center, the uh, Wine and Coast Comprehensive Health Center, we built a COVID-19 hotline, a drive-through testing center, and was the main hub for most of the community here and where um, it was kind of a thing for schools that couldn't have, that didn't have testing in their schools, they could come to our health center also um, to get tested. And with that model, we shared that with our other um, AHARA partners, the other um, FQHCs across the state, um, and helping them kind of um, build their own infrastructure or kind of strengthen what they've already had um, when it came to testing and other mitigation um, interventions and strategies that they were already applying or they were um, sharing with their community. And just to go over some of the data that we collected in this first part of our project um, that helped drive what we are doing now today, um, I, I guess this paper, um, the first paper that we published was based on uh, the data that was collected from March through August um, 2021, I believe. Um, and this was um, most of our survey uh, data or data that was collected was through um, our testing um, through our test, uh, point of care testing uh, locations and sites. Um, when community members came in to get tested, they would fill out a short survey where we asked them a little bit about their COVID experience, some of their health data. Um, and with the data that uh, came back, 61.7% um, um, of respondents were Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. Um, and next being um, Asians at 17.4%. When it comes to um, collecting data and the data that's represented um, in this paper and in our work, you know, it, it's not hard for us uh, compared to um, the continent uh, to get NHPI data. But even within that, there are different communities, um, you know, some of the communities that Carla um, talked about, like COFA migrants, um, those with, um, you know, those in the Micronesian um, pop, uh, community, those in the Marshallese community, um, you know, although they may be originally from the same area, language and again, um, how we are able to communicate them um, is different. So, you know, the, the needs of, of um, those populations did vary, you know, even if we were collecting NHPI data. Um, and some, just to share some key results from our paper, um, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and Asians trusted and used more unofficial sources of information. 
um, and close friends and family members were the most trusted unofficial sources of information. So that was one of the things that um, we can talk about a little bit later, but when it comes to kind of the culture in Hawaii, um, you know, there's this thing called coconut wireless and um, that's basically word of mouth. You hear something from a friend, from a family member and that becomes kind of story and it just echoes and gets shared throughout the community. You know, and, and we found that to be super interesting because what was important in the way that um, we were able to do outreach and kind of combat some of the vaccine hesitancy or some of the disbeliefs that some community members had about the pandemic was actually just talking to them, you know, being present in community and having these conversations um, to make them more comfortable and understand um, and getting that education out to them was super important and very successful in how um, some of our community members um, were more accepting of um, taking the vaccine. Um, and trust and consumption of information are key in vaccine uptake, you know, and that was part of the conversation also is that what what was the conversation like um, hearing from community members and the the sources of information that they were trusting and what does that conversation look like um, in combating some of that misinformation. So um, Sheridan also can share a little bit more about that um, in, in those strategies. Um, but peer effect uh, messaging from peers have a greater effect on vaccine uptake. Um, something that we found was that, you know, within the schools, um, you know, the conversations that we were having with teenagers through some of our work was super important um, in getting those into the home. You know, when when children are hearing something at school or they're learning about something, we hope that they go home and share that with their family. And it was very important for us to kind of find that base of how can we better spread um, education and why not be it through the, the youth and through the student and being engaged in that conversation. Um, some of the top reasons um, we found for, uh, for not vaccinating were the concerns about side effects, um, not trusting the vaccine and tr trusting the government. Um, and I, I feel like those may be um, similar in other populations also. Um, but yes, I'd like to turn it over now to Sheridan, who will kind of explain a little bit more about these strategies and kind of how we take this data and kind of our experiences in the field um, and what we've done so far and where we're going in the future. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, so I'll move this through this very quickly. I know in the interest of time, but so thinking about the results of our paper, um, in order to address our population's needs, we wanted to ensure that, you know, we were a ever present fixture in our community. So one of the strategies that we employed was providing support services and access to resources, especially in terms of COVID-19 testing. So we've actually had um, and trained community members to implement um, our study at each of our service areas and we wanted to ensure that we met with these teams um, regularly to have that bi-directional feedback um, and think of new strategies to kind of meet the um, needs of each community. We love to say that community health is not a one size fits all. So kind of how Erin was explaining that even though we do kind of come from similar backgrounds and our population makeup is very similar, we can't just assume that a strategy that works in one area is going to carry over and translate into another area. Um, so we wanted to make sure that each of our service areas had very specific needs that were being met. Um, and we wanted that to come from the community members themselves. We wanted them to tell us what they were lacking and what they needed so that we could better support them and kind of their health outcomes and improving their um, health status. And so we've had um, kind of many different challenges, I think, especially with, you know, the sudden surges and case numbers and mandates were changing rapidly. Um, right under us and then we had kind of shortages in terms of personnel so every time that we had one of those kind of setbacks we wanted to take a step back assess each situation and kind of pivot our needs to um, our community members the local schools that we served and each fqhc because um, that was a very important part of our project was ensuring that our community was being seen and heard in all of our project outcomes next slide um, so one of the things that we've done is kind of disseminating our project work and our findings um, through different outlets. So we've shared our results with 
the FQHC administration through um, kind of presentations and our infographics. Um, and in terms of these infographics, we wanted to make them easily digestible. Um, data and statistics, it's not easy to look at even if you have a science background. So knowing that our community members um, kind of were struggling with that, um, we wanted to make sure that we were providing information that was easily digestible, easily um, understandable, um, so that they were getting the information that they needed. And then also having those meetings with the Hawaii State Department of Health, um, that was very important to kind of talk about the changes in COVID-19 cases, any updates that the Department of Health was experiencing or that our project was experiencing, um, and kind of learning new ways to kind of combat those and then Aaron also talked about the research community advisory meetings. Those are very important because that is when we also had kind of those shared perspectives from community members to kind of talk about um, what they were noticing in the community and kind of how we could build upon those um, strategies and kind of um, look at different ways of addressing the needs. Um, but really the big magic maker was our community immense. That's where all the magic happened. Um, for example, we would go to the farmers markets here out in Y&I, or we attended community food distributions. Um, and that's kind of where we had our one off conversations with community members. So, you know, auntie's coming up to pick up her COVID-19 test kit, you know, she's talking to us about her experiences and kind of learning more about who makes up our community and the experiences that that they go through in their daily lives that really shaped our project and kind of what our project outcomes were and how we were going to pivot in terms of the shifting needs of our communities. Um, so we really transitioned from a project that was doing solely COVID-19 testing to a project that is now focusing on more educational aspects and increasing health literacy in our populations um, and kind of learning more ways of how we can um, kind of improve health equity in our communities. Next slide. So to kind of talk about our infographics a little bit more, um, here's some examples of the infographics that um, one of our research assistants made for us. Um, we'll be um, sharing the one on the left with all of you folks, the one with the black background, because that kind of describes um, the research paper that Aaron talked about previously. So um, if you folks are interested in learning more about the paper that we wrote out and kind of the findings that we took away from that, uh, we'll be able to share that with you folks. But on the right side, um, those are some of the infographics that our research assistant made um, for each specific service area that we have. Um, so in terms of our COVID-19 testing numbers, we wanted to show our community members that, you know, we're appreciative of their participation in our study and that they were actually making a difference in their communities by coming with us to test. And, you know, it, it's it was a very, quick process, you know, five minutes, they're in and out taking their test, but um, we wanted to show that we were appreciative of them kind of advocating for their own health and advocating for the health of their community. Um, and we shared these summary reports with the community members. Um, and we made sure that we, we wanted to make sure that we were doing it in a culturally appropriate way, um, because we know that, as we said before, each community is different, although we come from similar backgrounds. So we wanted to make sure that we were providing uh, resources for them that um, were going to land with them and that they were going to understand and take away, especially knowing that um, this source of information may not be the most trusted in our community. So we wanted to make sure that we wanted um, a way to change that narrative for them. Next slide. So another way that we've been engaging with our community, um, especially now that we're pivoting more towards health education and improving health literacy, um, especially in our youth populations, our youth are the next generation of change makers and they're ready to make change. So we wanted to make sure that we were um, kind of providing resources for them as well. So we actually had a group of students work with us to build up some of our social media pages, especially our Instagram and TikTok pages. So. If you want to follow us and check us out, <laughs> our handle is right there at PAC underscore Hawaii. But these uh, projects were strictly youth led. Um, our youth created videos and skits and they were um, kind of coming up with funny skits so that, you know, we they were connecting with the youth audience a little bit more. Um, 
and kind of you know lessen that serious tone that sometimes comes along with the data and statistics. Um, and then it allowed them to show the community perspective and empower the youth that you know they were going to school with or they were playing sports with. Um, and that kind of all set that up to be a platform of health advocacy and a way for them to um, kind of share their share their stories and advocate for their own health and advocate for the resources that they wanted to see in their communities. And it's been a very integral part in building our health education aspects. Um, so we actually have health education platforms such as EdApp, um, which is like a micro learning platform that we wanted to focus on, um, especially in terms of online bullying and kind of healthy social media use. Um, so that's something that we've been currently working on. And then we've also been working on a health literacy game, um, which is something that's very exciting. It's, you know, kind of, it's not um, common to see a health literacy game. Um, so it'll be a board game and an online game. So that's something that's very exciting and um, something that we wanted to highlight, especially in our youth um, populations. Um, so yeah, so social media has been a very big um, player, I think, in terms of our community aspects, and especially in knowing that peer effect does kind of um, have an effect on vaccine up uptake. So maybe that's something that we can improve upon a little bit more, I think, as we move forward with our project. Next slide. Um, Welcome, Welcome to, to News for you. you and today's hot talk. We will try and pause this. There we go. Um, so we also have collaborations with um, some of the school-based health centers that um, the Wine Coast Comprehensive provides in um, our local schools that we serve. So the school-based health centers are an extension of health services um, so that we can ensure that support services are present and accessible to students throughout the school year, um, especially in terms of kind of professional development with uh, for students who are interested in healthcare. Um, this is one of the ways that we've been able to collaborate with the students and the youth population. So the students in the health career pathway um, kind of class, they actually created their own little video um, that kind of debunked some of the myths surrounding the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and that was something that was strictly created by them. They kind of came up with the script. They had some help with the um, professional videography. But you know, that was something that they were noticing in their schools and amongst their peers that there were um, some concerns regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. I think especially from our paper that we saw that there was concerns about the side effects and kind of that lack of trust in the government. Um, so the students took it upon themselves to create a little video to kind of debunk some of those common myths um, around the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and that was one of the ways that they were getting involved with their community. And we were very help, um, happy to support them and ensuring that they were creating something that was culturally sensitive and that was something that they were proud of to show their community members. And next slide. So I think through all in all, I think the biggest strategy that we've employed was just encouraging our community members to advocate for themselves and their peers by making informed health, health decisions. Um, but we know that can only be done through trust between not only our project and our communities, but um, between each other, between each individual. And for our project, we provided, provided and established trust through kind of consistency, uh, making sure that we were at every community event that we could be at, making sure that we were always willing to listen and be able to, you know, kind of talk with community members that we were actually um, willing to sit down and have a conversation with them, even if it meant, um, you know, our work got put on hold for a little bit. Um, but that was something that was important to us is to make sure that we were consistent in the message that we were delivering and the message that we were putting out into the community and being transparent about it as well. There was, you know, it was very hard during the pandemic because of that lack of trust, but we wanted to be sure that we were being transparent with our community members that, you know, this is what we were doing from our study design to our budget, to our project results, making sure that they saw every aspect of that and that there was nothing that was hidden from them. And then we wanted to continue to grow our trust with the community through our outreach programs, um, whether that was point of care testing, um, COVID-19 self-test kit distributions and our social media outreach. Um, so that we were a recognizable and accepted program within the community, um, that people trusted us enough to come 
um, if they had questions. Um, we've actually had a lot of community members who maybe who were hesitant uh, to get the vaccine when it first came out, but after kind of having conversations with them and pointing them in the direction of credible sources, they actually did end up getting the vaccine. So that was something that was very um, touching for us to know that we were making a difference as well. And then we also wanted to make sure that our team was made up of community members um, from the community that they serve. So I work out of um, the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center and I'm actually from Waianae. That's, that's where I live. That's where I've been raised my um, basically my whole life. Um, so that was something that we wanted to highlight because it's important to kind of have that connection and building rapport with community members and other partners um, who are from the same community, who are from different communities. You know, that's kind of how we build it, like kind of joking with, you know, our community members that come in about whose side is better or who's part of um, Oahu is prettier, who has the nicest beaches, you know, those kind of set us up to have those um, connections with community members. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were there to help them make equitable decisions um, made by community members and for community members. Um, so yeah, so that that that's a very big part of our project um, has really been the community aspect and making sure that our community is um, seen and that they are um, heard and that we we were there as um, support that we weren't there to you know overtake anything that we were strictly there to help them out. Um, but yeah, I think that is the end of our presentation. Wonderful. Well, Aaron and Sheridan, thank you so much for you know your presentation on your research and your community engagement efforts. I mean, it's wonderful to learn more about you know just how you and the rest of uh, PAC and the Health Center have have worked to empower your your local communities through that. So, thank you. Okay, well, so we'll go ahead and move into our final presentation. Um, so our final presenter is uh, Panita Johnsa uh, from Thai Community Development Center. Um, and so just to introduce Panita a bit more, um, Panita is uh, a directing attorney at the Thai Community Development Center where she manages the delivery of uh, comprehensive social and legal services, including trauma-informed, culturally and linguistically appropriate victims' rights representation and uh, legal services, including uh, affirmative immigration uh, relief, labor claims, uh, victims' rights advocacy, restitution, uh, victim representation in a criminal setting, uh, civ uh, civil legal assistance, and family reunification. Uh, Panita graduated from Southwestern Law School in Los Angeles, California. Uh, she is a past president of the Thai American Bar Association and uh, received the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association Best Under 40 Award in 2021. Uh, Panita currently serves as a commissioner on the California Access to Justice Commission. Uh, so thanks so much for being here, Panita. Uh, take it away. Thank you for the warm intro, Jeff. And thank you for all the organizers that brought me here today with you all. Um, I will go ahead and start my slideshow. Um, I, I really appreciate um, seeing the other presenters as well. Um, our, our take at the Thai Community Development Center is a little bit different um, because we are a community-based organization that was founded in 1994. Our mission is to advance the social and economic well-being of low and moderate income Thais and other ethnic communities in the greater Los Angeles area through a comprehensive community development strategy. So, you know, with all that you heard in my bio, I actually am a practicing attorney and I, I oversee both the legal and direct services. And so with the COVID-19 pandemic, that also included all of the, the relief that our organization had um, to provide to our community members. And even though we're based in Los Angeles, um, I actually do have clients nationwide because we're the only Thai um, community center that provides services um, to, to Thai members of the community. And we do a lot of referrals, um, but at the same time, um, sometimes there is such a lack of access because of our limited English proficient um, community members. ICDC was actually born 
out of the Northridge earthquake in 1994. And because our executive director who founded the organization saw there was a need for services for low income Thai uh, community members who were impacted, um, Thai CDC was kind of born out of that to bring those resources to those communities. So among the communities, among the programs that we house at Thai CDC include community asset building, um, and you'll you'll um, you, if you've been to LA, I hope you visit Thai Town because we did found uh, Thai Town as an economic development strategy um, back in 1999 in the East Hollywood area, and um, the there's there's a photo of the street on in Thai Town, and then below is our Palm Village affordable housing complex, which is near the Thai temple in North Hollywood. A lot of what I work on is human rights advocacy because unfortunately the Thai population is impacted disproportionately by human trafficking in both sex and labor industries. And we also do a lot in um, community empowerment. We have a very, um, very active schedule actually because we've run the East Hollywood certified farmers market as well that was started um, through funding through the USDA and that currently is in operation and we're also um, under construction with our Thai town marketplace project also in Thai town but we also do a lot of other um, kind of uh, engagement with the community um, you know to to get their voices heard through town halls through uh, voting initiatives um, and also in the legal unit, we also do naturalization. Um, and I, I mentioned Thai, Thai Town and the Thai Town Marketplace a little bit earlier. We also organize cleanups for the neighborhood and street um, tree plantings so that there could be more greenery um, in, in addition to all the other things we're doing to make sure that um, you know needs um, with food insecurity and other needs in that, that localized area are being met. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, Thai CDC actually had to pivot and come into full force with a new program called Thai CDC Cares, the COVID-19 Aid Rapid Response Relief and Emergency Services Program. And we did this primarily because we were seeing that essential workers in our community were not being served. And what was happening was a lot of them are already low wage vulnerable workers um, who are limited English proficient and aren't able to access um, resources as well as health resources, right? So we actually started two hotlines and hired intake specialists so that we could start doing these um, intakes um, to provide resources to our populations. Um, but we, we, we had, I, I think a really intense intake process because we actually provided cash aid. So we were we actually provided um, nearly two, $2 million dollars in cash aid during the COVID-19 pandemic to people that were impacted by the pandemic. Um, so you know they might have lost their job or um, you know had to stay home because there was no childcare or the kids were on Zoom school. You know just some way that they or even their business was impacted. Um, and we had to look outside of Thai CDC's local area. We actually hired folks in San Francisco um, because that's where we found that talent. And so they worked totally remotely. Every time folks came in to get their checks or fresh produce, they'd be like, are you so-and-so? I'm like, no, 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 they're not even here. <laughs> um, but in addition to that, we worked really closely with our LA Department of Public Health because many of the health directives and the health officer orders related to COVID-19 and vaccine information were not provided in Thai. And folks didn't know what was going on. And I think this was really important too, because a lot of our community members are entrepreneurs and small business owners that are limited English proficient. So they didn't know what changes had to be made within their own businesses and how to treat their workers um, or even what, what they had to do um, in terms of interfacing with the public. Um, and then, of course, we started hosting our own pop-up vaccine clinics to bring um, both actually test 
testing into testing first and then the vaccine clinics into the communities that we serve um, to make sure that folks could um, be met where they're at, like literally <laughs> if it's at the Thai temple on the weekends um, in the San Fernando Valley or even in the other areas like La Puente in LA County. So we went all over, um, all over LA County to kind of meet people where they're at um, and host it at our farmer's market because we already had that set up on a weekly basis, twice a week. Um, and then, you know, during those intakes, we also screened for other benefits that folks would be eligible for. So, you know, I, I, I realized that even though we're not social workers, we actually do a lot of social work because the access is just not there for our populations. Um, and then once we do all the screenings, we can refer appropriately to folks who are qualified and capable of helping these populations. For example, we also did a lot of mental health referrals um, during this time for, for, for folks who were being impacted. And we were able to locate mental health services in Thai. Um, so we now we have a, like a direct point of contact to a local um, API organization that provides services. Um, and we also built new relationships with folks, which um, I'll talk about a little bit later because we do um, fresh produce distributions. And you know we, we basically reach out to a lot of other service providers and resources. Even the LA Public Library comes to our events to table and make sure people have access to getting library cards and things like that. Um, and we also pivoted to provide eviction defense within our legal unit because we saw that the folks who were being impacted the number one reason they needed cash aid was to pay rent. And because they weren't working, they weren't able to pay rent. Um, so we, we wanted to ensure that those processes, um, you know, whether they're being evicted or being harassed or whatever is happening to them, they're getting a fair chance at that process. Um, but we also came to realize that a lot of our populations are, um, they, they operate kind of, um, between the lines in a gray area. So a lot of them didn't have formal lease agreements and wasn't able to utilize the legal remedies that we had geared up for them. So sometimes, um, even though we, you know, we were ready to help, we couldn't because you know, they didn't formalize relationships with their landlord. Um, and, and sometimes when you work with populations, you see a lot of undocumented folks too who are not able to make those formalized connections because they don't have, you know, credit IDs um, and, you know, things, things that of that nature that would make that work. Um, and we also helped, of course, with rent relief applications that were available at the time because they, they were not being provided in Thai. So I, I myself was, you know, going around helping people with rent relief applications. And, you know, even though it's a long shot because there's always a small pot of money, um, some of our community members got it. And when they got it, that's that's a win for us. Um, and in terms of the barriers that our community faces, there's a lot of them, right? So aside from being you know, a low wage, vulnerable worker that may be undocumented, we're talking about um, language, culture, transportation, technology. Um, we we also operate an affordable housing for seniors, that, um, the one near the Thai Temple in North Hollywood. And boy, it's not just language, but technology. In the beginning, we actually had to set up appointments to get testing or vaccines. And it was through this web portal that LA County ran. And no way would our seniors be able to do that on their own. You know, these are these are folks that are not not tech savvy, don't have access. Um, Fortunately, though, we did have an ally within the LA County Department of Public Health um, that set up a Center for Health Equity. So our ally, Scott Chan, he actually was able to um, basically advocate for our organization to be the ones to provide services, to translate materials. And so, you know, he, he knew that also small community-based organizations like ours don't have capacity. So those government contracts for us are a big deal. Like we need to get paid for what we do. And you know, just because we're here serving the community, yes, we will not say no because we wanna to continue to make um, those resources available to our populations. We also you know, are a nonprofit organization that needs to have a sustainable uh, system. So since April of 2021, we actually provided 
vaccine clinics. And this was a turn for us. We used lab partners. At first, we started with the LA County um, Department of Public Health, who sent out their mobile vaccination teams to the locations that we requested. And we were the site hosts, and they would provide us um, with what, what we needed in terms of vaccines, nurses, um, at our location in East Hollywood, because of the area, they actually provide us with two security guards and a porta potty, all the tables and chairs and canopies to this day. So we do that twice a week um, because we also have other barriers in terms of how, um, you know, even though LA County and um, Department of Public Health are very um, well informed about equity and cultural competency, um, we actually did not prefer having their nurses coming to our site uh, because we had some incidents um, with them where they engaged in altercations with um, people in the area. We actually have a high proportion of unhoused people in the Hollywood area in Los Angeles um, that are not mentally stable. And, and so we try to use like de-escalation tactics and we train our staff all on de-escalation uh, but we also found that some nurses just didn't know our community and didn't respect our community and were completely xenophobic, right? So we actually switched over and partnered with a local community lab called Passport Health. Um, and that partnership has been going strong. They send their nurse twice a week to us um, to be hosting um, with us at the, the vaccine clinic. Um, and, you know, through it all, we're basically getting information um, and working on all kinds of different campaigns from you can see in this flyer the we can do this campaign which was a federal campaign at the time um and some you know other other uh, folks who wanted more um, reach because the data showed that in our localized area of east hollywood we actually had have a really low rate of vaccinations but also um boosters Right, so right now, even though they got maybe their first and second shot, but that is already over a year ago. So that's why we continue to make those vaccinations available um, so that they can come when they're ready to come. Um, and we have a host of other programs at Thai CDC that really complements what we're doing now um, in terms of um, providing health equity through those sites. So we continue to work with LA County Department of Public Health to um, you know, give out PPEs, those hand sanitizers and masks and COVID test kits. Um, we came up with a lot of different messaging throughout the years. Uh, last October, we had a bivalent booster blitz, um, tried to make it catchy so folks would come in. I think right now we actually have a grant um, that is providing gift cards and incentives. Um, to to get the the vaccines, um, and we even incorporated um, our very own Thai New Year um, as a theme for a campaign, the Safe Song Friend cap campaign, um, and you know, kind of combine all of these events together with other um, activities that we're doing. So we still provide fresh produce every other month, along with dry food goods, um, and then have have other folks come to table with us so that it could be, you know, that hub of health and wellness that we're trying to reach. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we do host community health workers that are certified through um, public health and also have a public health council program in LA where Department of Public Health partners with community-based organizations to do outreach to essential workers. Um, by industry. So we, we have the restaurant industry where we work with a lot of Thai mom and pop shops um, that need the help the most. And we continue to provide their staff with PPEs and COVID test kits. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the times later, you know, in the pandemic, they didn't want to know when their workers were sick because then they couldn't come to work. So we, we did face a lot of kind of uphill um, in terms of um, trying to get folks to, to vaccinate and to test. Um, but I, I think in the end, the Thai population was um, more open to the vaccinations um, among, among Southeast Asians. And here's our flyer that we had created for a Thai New Year last year. It was, the, the slogan was eat, celebrate, vaccinate. And we provided both testing and um, vaccines. So 
you know, when folks started coming out, um, if, if you guys know, Thai New Year is actually in April, but because of the pandemic, we didn't want to host it in April, and it felt a little bit safer um, when August came around. Um, but we still wanted to have a big celebration where we closed down 13 blocks in the East Hollywood area in Thai Town to have this huge celebration. And, you know, it worked. We had these mobile sites throughout those 13 blocks and folks came to those, were able to talk to nurses and then had people to navigate them in language because our community health workers were there on site. Um, and here are some photos from some of our vaccine clinics. We work very closely with a lot of government officials actually that uh, reach out to us when they are able to provide uh, resources. So I was surprised to learn that even our state senator, Marina Elena Durazo, she provided um, testing and vaccination before it was widely available to our to specifically seniors when it became available to seniors. Um, and then this one was with our council member um, in Council District 13 in Los Angeles. So they they wanted a site within their district where we were able to help bring our community health workers to navigate because once the patients get there, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go and you know they don't know how to say I want it in my left arm. <laughs> so we had to basically station one community health worker at each station until you know um, they got to their waiting area. So a lot of folks wouldn't know either that they have to wait for 15 minutes. Um, and then of course, here's a shot of one of our um, events at a Thai temple. Um, we, did, we did vaccinate a lot of the uh, monks as well. Um, and there, there are some cultural limitations with that because they're actually not supposed to have any physical contact with women, um, but there is an exception for health reasons. So um, it depends on the monk, but then, you know, we would have to engage in that conversation be like, oh, is it okay? And like, sometimes there were only female nurses. So we'd be like, you know, there's only female nurses, um, but because of that health exception, we were able to do that. Um, so that's one of the, the cultural, um, cultural things that we had to deal with. So within Thai CDC, um, you know, we work on all these things because we look at serving our community holistically. So we have programs that focus on human rights advocacy, um, community and individual asset building, access to better health and health care, and family and children's services so that um, folks have access to public benefits, and community empowerment. Um, to make sure that our neighborhood remains beautiful, um, that folks are, you know, talking about being civically engaged and equitable development. And a lot of this, you know, people just don't understand um, at the community level what, what we're working toward. But once they understand what we're doing, um, and I, we get a lot of information through studies and surveys and focus groups, um, once, once they see what we're doing, we actually get more, more engagement. So, you know, these are our three pillars of wholeness, you know, meeting people where they're at, like we talked about, um, to get them their services, both social services, legal services, um, creating a healthy and sustainable community through our farmer's market, healthcare access. Um, you know, we, we actually started a NIH study um, National Institute of Health study with our local um, North, Cal State Northridge um, academic team as well to study how COVID-19 affected Southeast Asian populations in the LA area. And Thai CDC, um, our, our ED is our principal investigator um, that's working on that project. So aside from the direct services, we also do some research. Um, we want to make sure that the data being collected is disaggregated, but we have the other problem that not enough folks are studying our populations for that data to be made available. <laughs> so now we've also kind of branched out into making sure that um, our voices are being heard and put you know, in these focus groups or taking surveys where we can actually collect um, data on our population. And then we also have um, advocacy and know your rights workshops so that um, you know folks know how you know not not just what their rights are but how to assert their rights um, and so that's that's one of the, the other areas that we work on to make people whole thank you
Well, uh, Panita, thanks so much for uh, sharing with us. I mean, first of all, the wide range of services offered by Thai CDC and, and also just how um, quickly Thai CDC really moved to, to meet the needs of, of our local communities in the pandemic. So thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Kev for the panel and Q&A um, with the time that we have remaining. Yes, all right. Um, thank you again, all guest speakers for sharing all that you do for the community. It's been truly wonderful. Uh, with um, the time limited, um, I will pose to everyone, uh, I guess, two questions and I'll move on to Q&A. So far, I've documented that we have one um, Q&A from our attendees, but if any other attendees have any questions, um, please feel free to um, post, or if you also have comments and show love for our guest speakers, we will connect to as well. Uh, we'll move in order um, of um, who is presenting, so Epic, PAX, and then um, Tai CDC, and I'll pose a two-in-one kind of question, um, and I'll post it in the chat too for y'all can reference it too. So what are some of the unique challenges that community members that you work with face when it comes to accessing COVID-19 vaccines series? Um, and if that resonates with you, and if it doesn't, you can also would consider this as a group of uh, folks who are social workers. Um, what are some ways that social workers can support the AA and HPI community on this matter? Uh, and I'll pass it over to Carla, and then we'll get a little follow the progression of the presenters. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think I'll share on the question about unique challenges for the communities we work with. Um, I think for Pacific Islanders, I mentioned that you know there are some um, statuses um, that only exist in our communities, and I think. Um, a big one is, you know, for the Kofa community under the Compact of Free Association, and um, they were only recently restored access to Medicaid during the pandemic, um, so December 2020, and before that didn't have, you know, could not access public health care, um, even though they had some of the highest rates of COVID-19 um, throughout um, the, the U.S. So I think that was a unique, you know, structural challenge um, for us. Um, you know, it's sad that it had to come during a time of crisis um, because COVID, I mean, COFA communities had, you know, been uh, experiencing longstanding health inequities um, that stemmed from, you know, U.S. militarization. Um, so that is something that was, you know, a long time coming. Um, I think another um, unique challenge uh, for our communities is that um, just the size of our population, um, us being 1% of the US population and in every other circle, probably less than 1%, it's so hard for us to um, garner resources and support um, because we're always being asked to justify our needs with numbers. Um, and people want to have, you know, uh, to, to impact uh, or have an impact on on a you know a significant population, um, but that's you know a really flawed way of of you know addressing um, health inequities, especially when you're working with um, more more marginalized um, communities like Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Um, and I think that um, when it comes to um, uh, also this, uh, just generally Pacific Islanders among the five uh, racial groups are the most uh, overlooked, um, not only when it comes to data, but just historical relationships with the government. Um, it was so hard for our local counties, public health departments to find us. They had never worked with uh, even community-based organizations who had existed um, for so long as being the safety nets to our communities when these state agencies or local agencies um, weren't there. Um, so they had to, you know, find us. Or actually, we found them. It was uh, it was on our community leaders to reach out to, um, you know, county officials to say, hey, you know, you guys are completely missing the mark. Where our community is in the blind spot, and you know, now we're here, and we need you all to trust us to um, do what we need to do. But we need your support. We can't do it by ourselves. Um, so I think those are some of the very unique ways that our communities have been impacted by this. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody, uh, you know, there are some very 
unique stereotypes about Pacific Islanders too, as far as like what health issues impact us. Um, you know, a lot of times we just think about um, the chronic illnesses, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, but we don't think about the mental health impacts that are uh, invading our community. We have some of the highest suicide, suicide rates in our youth in the Pacific Islands, and that's not talked about enough. And that has also a huge, um, that they were also hugely impacted during the pandemic in, in being isolated and not having access to basic needs. Um, so, you know, in, I think there's a need to also reframe the way Pacific Islander narratives are being shared in the media. Um, not only that we are that we were most impacted by COVID because of chronic illnesses, but there are so many other issues that have been um, that have not been addressed for so long because of, you know, just flat out our people were were colonized, and that's still all, all of those impacts are still happening today. You know, the Compact of Free Association Treaty was set to expire this year, and we're just finalizing negotiations of what that will look like. Um, so our people are still under, you know. Um, heavy um, impacts from, from U.S. Uh, militarization and modern colonialism and all of that ties together to, to COVID, to the health inequities, to the racial inequities that we experience. All right, thank you. Erin, um, can you share or do you have anything else to add for PAC? Yeah, I, I will. Well, I think one of the biggest takeaways for us when it comes to kind of like the kind of the uh, structural um, aspect is that, you know, in these rural areas, the health infrastructure isn't that great. You know, we don't get a lot of um, support when it comes to some of the resources that you could find in the metro areas. Um, and it usually takes a lot of us in our community and our leadership here in our areas to kind of reach out for help. Um, you know, even with some of our government officials, our trusted officials here in our community, um, it's tough for them to kind of kind of get some type of recognition and some kind of say in what resources are needed for their community. Um, and I, I do see some of I think these are my students in in this um, uh, in this webinar, but you know, kind of their experience and what they share in their work that they do with community um, in mental health services in some of the work that they've done with the Department of Health. Um, we, we see that there is some, some issues with infrastructure and how that, you know, just, just the whole um, equal and equitable access to resources, is it still needs to be addressed. And it's taking a long time for that to kind of be, become something that's at the forefront of what the community needs are. So, you know, going forward with that, you know, there's kind of this longstanding um, pillar as this health center becomes kind of just the focal point and the only resource that some of community members have. Um, and I think that's one thing that we can kind of take away from this is that we do need to bolster kind of our health infrastructure um, in these rural areas. Um, and sure, and if you have anything to add, maybe about um, what social workers can um, take away or how we can support them. Yeah, I think, um... But also in terms of what Aaron was speaking about in terms of the health infrastructure um, in YNI and at the YNI Close Comprehensive Health Center, we do work in a medically underserved area. So the next closest big area hospital is about 20 to 30 minutes away for most of our population on the west side of Oahu, um, which is just not feasible, especially when you know transportation comes into play. It's just not accessible for many of our community members. Um, and I think also in terms of um, some of the misinformation and disinformation that kind of came along with the vaccine. I think one of the things that I heard the most often was, I don't have money to pay for the vaccine or I don't have health insurance. Um, and, you know, kind of talking with community members and being like, that's okay. Like, you don't have to pay any money. It's completely free to get the vaccine or you don't need health um, insurance to get the vaccine. Um, so kind of hearing some of those um, maybe um, that lack of information and knowing about the vaccine or what it entails or where to get it, um, I think was something that we kind of faced often um, in our uh, kind of our COVID-19 testing um, services um, and also just health literacy in general. I think we often experienced that um, some of our community members 
um, just didn't know some of their basic information. I think especially for our youth, they didn't know their home address or they didn't know their parents' phone numbers. Um, so some of those experiences kind of shaped the um, projects that we created or some of the programs that we created to kind of address some of those situations. Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind in terms of um, vaccine uptake and um, just healthcare in general. I think just accessibility, health literacy, and um, maybe some of the misinformation that comes along with it. And I think in terms of the social workers and supporting that matter, um, we've actually been very lucky for PAC because we do have um, some very close networks of social workers that we work with out of the um, Ryan Coast Comprehensive Health Center. Um, there's off the top of my head, I can think of the um, one or two that work out of the school-based health centers and one of the social workers that works out of our research department. Um, so kind of having those close connections with those social workers, I think really helped us to bridge the gap in communities um, and kind of um, learning more about resources. So one of the social workers at the school-based health center, she actually got us in contact with um, Teen Link Hawaii um, and they were very integral in kind of building some of our youth programs and learning about um, kind of the services they were providing and how we could better support them. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of social workers, kind of bridging some of those gaps between um, community and healthcare or whether that's um, youth, um, kind of the, the youth populations or our other minority populations, I think that's been a very important part of our work is kind of finding those connections. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your insights. And then Panita. Sure. So um, as I mentioned, some of the populations that we work with are low-wage, vulnerable workers. And some of the challenges that they face are that they can't get time off or they don't want to take the vaccine because of the oncoming symptoms, where then they would have to take time off and that would affect their income. And so we were able to partner um, doing our direct outreach at restaurants. We even partnered with a local branch of McDonald's in the Hollywood area where the same um, manager managed five locations. And so we actually set up a vaccine clinic at McDonald's for their employees and they brought workers from those five branches to us <laughs> so that their workers would have access and wouldn't have to take time off. Um, and in working with social workers, I would really encourage co-case managing with community-based organizations because the communities that we serve know us um, and they trust us. And when you reach out to them concurrently, um, they they can you know hear things not only in their own language, but then with a trust relationship that already exists and can potentially um, transfer to you as a social worker. And that just makes things a lot easier, especially in communication. Um, you know, sometimes they don't recognize phone number, they're not gonna pick up, but they'll pick up our phone number because they recognize us. Um, so, you know, just having that relationship already in place helps a whole lot. Sometimes social workers actually call me um, and introduce themselves and say, I have this type of person, they need this and that, do you have any referrals? And yes, of course I could give them referrals, but at the same time, there's a lot of gaps in coverage because you know those referrals will not go through if that trust relationship isn't there. Sure, all right. Thank you everyone for your insights. Uh, we do have one Q&A, uh, but I might not pass this to the panelists just for the sake of the nature of the question. Along with that, we are at our time cap. Um, I will have Jane post the eval link for those who are trying to obtain CEUs. But at least to at least address that final question is that um, I think Dong asked during a presentation if um, there could be data posted regarding va um, COVID vaccines um, in the community. Uh, I know that um, the following presentations have posted a lot of research information. I'm not sure if um, PACS or TICDC or EPIC has um, quick links and resources, and I can also post that onto the chat so people can access. Um, I will also post the guest speakers' websites and Instagrams just so that uh, if folks have any other questions or want to find direct information on your websites um, or social medias um, that they have access to as well too. Um, but beyond that, be sure to look at Jane's website link. Um, and then we could go towards the evaluation so that um, if anyone that needs it um, can complete it. But just to wrap up and for folks who can stay back, lay back, you're welcome to. 
Um, but there is a evaluation. We we'll deeply appreciate any feedback. Thank you again, guest speakers, for sharing about um, all that you have done for your communities. Um, and of course, it's attention for this um, presentation is for us to um, work with y'all, highlight all that y'all do for the community. And of course, we welcome further collaboration in the future as we are also National Association of Social Workers. Um, and yeah, I'll have it noted, case managers can definitely work more with CBOs, highlighting more of the current cases that aren't generally talked about within PEI and Asian communities as well too. And I think as we further this collaboration, this cultural awareness building, we can only work together to further the, the well-being of the communities that are generally marginalized and misrepresented too. Uh, that being said, thank you everyone for taking your time to come out on this Saturday. Uh, we'll close out. And yeah, at least all of the resources I will post on the chat for everyone to review. Thank you.